This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. You heard it right. Since 1966, that is 51 years, your place for state and national ag news. And so another show begins. Hi again, folks. Welcome to the Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Happy to have you along with us for the next 30 minutes. Coming up on the show, it's been a mild winter to say the least, and that doesn't fare well for peach producers. What effect, if any, has the lack of chill hours had on this year's crop? Damon Jones takes a look at that. Also on the program, he's the new head of the EPA, but in the eyes of the American Farm Bureau, is Scott Pruitt the right man for the job? And then later, something right at your fingertips, the idea of farm to table via the internet. We'll talk to the owner of thedirtfarmer.com and see the valuable service he's offering to local customers. These stories and so much more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. While many of the people in the state are thrilled about the mild winter we've had, the same cannot be said for peach growers, as the lack of chill hours has them concerned about this year's crop. With harvest season just a few months away, Damon Jones gives you an update on where producers stand right now. Georgia didn't earn its title of the peach state for no reason, as they produce some of the highest quality peaches in the world year in and year out. However, there is plenty of cause for concern this growing season, as a warmer than expected winter has resulted in a lack of chill hours, which could have major effects on the crop. You can see kind of a split crop where you have some, some full size fruit and some really small fruit on the same tree. The pollination might be a little bit off. Um, we see some split pits, which everybody, I'm sure everybody's eating a peach has seen a split pit where it, it's open on the top. However, the damage, if any, will not be known until later next month when the buds start to blossom. Until then, all the growers can do is wait and hope. It's not an ideal winter, um, but uh, we, you see blooms on some trees, and uh, so we're, we've got hope that we'll have a crop. Uh, we have done all we could um, to, uh, to ensure that. One of the steps being taken is spraying the trees with Dormex, which has shown to boost chill hours for peaches in Florida. Growers are also playing a numbers game by pruning less off their trees this growing season. This year they've left a lot more wood, hoping that more wood will be more blooms. And if you have, you know, say if you have 300 stems that have two good fruit, if you have five, if you leave 500, maybe you've got, you know, that, that many more good fruit if there's not a bunch of good fruit on one stem. We're doing everything we can do. We're leaving more limbs on the tree um, to give us a chance for more peaches. And um, just whatever we can do, we'll do and we'll see what comes. It's a position the growers were in last year as well, as warmer temperatures resulted in a lack of chill hours for certain varieties. However, unlike 2016, there really hasn't been a cold snap to get them back on track. This year, instead of having a good cold February and January, it's been warm. We've had some 80 degree days, and those 80 degree days have made these, these, these lower chill varieties, even higher chill varieties, move a lot earlier than normal. Fortunately, many of the farmers in the area have learned from the past and chosen their varieties accordingly. The last time that we had an issue like this was 1974, and we have a real different um, menu of varieties that we have planted now than, than we had planted then. We don't have as many, as many high chilling varieties as we did, and um, that will play into the final uh, effect of the wintertime. While it's still far too early to tell, Cook does have an initial evaluation for this year's crop. I mean, all I can say right now is I probably, I think it probably be about like last year. Um, you know, we might have been 25% off depending on what variety and what time of year. You know, we had some definite, um, some definite issues with some, some certain varieties. Reporting from Peach County, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Damon, thank you very much. In other ag news, American Farm Bureau has given the big thumbs up to new EPA leader Scott Pruitt. According to the agency, Pruitt is the right man for the job, and he understands agricultural issues. Michael Clements has more. 
Pruitt previously served as Attorney General for Oklahoma before taking his new post. AFBF Senior Director of Regulatory Relations Don Parrish says Pruitt's leadership is a welcomed change to the agency. One of the things that I think Scott Pruitt means for agriculture is the opportunity to bring agricultural issues before the agencies in ways that we've not had before. He's had a close working relationship with Oklahoma Farm Bureau, and again, I think it is going to create a partnership that we haven't seen at EPA in a long time. Parrish says Pruitt has a proven track record on agricultural issues from his time as Oklahoma's Attorney General. And it's a track record of not just being Attorney General, it is a track record to trying to find solutions to environmental problems that's good for the environment as well as good for the economy and farmers in general. So that's a very positive step in the right direction. He says AFBF will work with EPA to find a replacement for the Waters of the U.S. rule. There's over 30 states that have challenged the WOTUS rule as not being consistent with congressional intent and really not working with states to make sure that rule does not overstep what Congress intended with regard to land use and water issues. So I do think WOTUS is going to be one of Mr. Pruitt's primary objectives and priorities, and we're looking forward to working with him on that. Michael Clements, Washington. Recently at the Georgia National Fairgrounds and Egg Center, soybean and small grain producers gathered for the annual Georgia-Florida Soybean Small Grain Expo. The event helps producers learn more about cutting-edge technology and techniques that can help farms boost yields and cut costs. Monitor's Mark Wildman has the story. Growing soybeans and other small grains in Georgia can be challenging, and finding the best strategies along with staying up to date on the latest advancements in the industry is critical to having a successful year. At the Georgia-Florida Soybean and Small Grain Expo, a large crowd got to hear from experts on many different topics. The purpose of the expo is to bring in speakers that are presenting the newest uh, research data that, uh, and to encourage uh, our soybean and small grain producers uh, to use those newer technologies and in increasing their yields. Those in attendance got to hear about smarter ways to irrigate, by using technology to lower cost and save water, an update on the farm bill, and how to make more profit off your land by growing ultra-late soybeans. The bottom line is, is that you're trying to make it uh, more profitable for, for the producers because, um, uh, you know, it's, it's always a crunch. E everything goes up, but commodity prices tend to go up and down, and, and what we're trying to do is, is, uh, is by using this new technology and advancing air science, and agriculture is to try to keep our farmers competitive with the world and to allow them to uh, reap some benefits and to continue to, uh, to produce food and fiber for our, for our nation. Even though this event is held in Georgia, the gathering is a combined effort with our neighbor to the south. The reason for that is, is that Florida has a small quantity of um, uh, soybean producers and consequently they need a representation. And, and, and when you join the Georgia-Florida Soybean Association, you also become a member of the American Soybean Association, which obviously does national lobbying efforts and that sort of thing. And so, yeah, we, uh, we're, we're, it's a symbiotic relationship that's worked out very, very well for the last 10 years or so. One of the topics that attendees were very interested in was growing ultra-late soybeans. Rome Etheridge from Seminole Crop Consulting discussed how this crop can take advantage of the land when it is typically not being utilized. Our corn harvest is early. It's in uh, late July, sometimes early August, so we've still got a lot of time in Georgia, especially deep south Georgia, where you've got uh, frost-free days. You've got sunshine and, and also taking advantage of that time and that uh, irrigation pivot is a good thing for, for many farmers to do uh, and have some extra income as well. He did caution growers that if they plan to use this strategy, to make sure they stay focused on the crop. You've got to do it right, uh, and it, it takes, takes monitoring. It's good to have a, a scout or consultant work with you, and you want to have irrigation, and uh, you want to be very, very timely. You want to, you want to watch the crop. Uh, you, don't, you want to watch the uh, weeds uh, and the insects. It's very important. As farmers gear up for the growing season, the information gained from this meeting will help farmers produce more grain and hopefully help manage input cost. Reporting from Perry, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Mark, thank you so much.
Peanut producers, beware. There's an old pest creating new problems. Up next, we'll hear from an expert who has some important tips on how to keep it away from your crop. Stay tuned. Dateline February 15th, 2017. While most of the metro Atlanta area is under a severe thunderstorm warning, nearly 500 Farm Bureau members from across the state are braving the elements for the annual Georgia Farm Bureau Day at the Capitol. For GFB President Gerald Long, that type of dedication is what the foundation of Farm Bureau is built on. It says we've got a lot of dedicated volunteers that, that knows the importance of Georgia Farm Bureau Day at the Capitol every year. And, and you know, we've got some new ones that's never been, but most of them, they come every year because they know how important it is. Our counties are so active and involved in talking to legislators and making sure their voice is heard at the Capitol. And that's what this day is so important. I mean, every, every year we have one of the largest turnouts of any, any group in, in, in Atlanta. And uh, this, this year is no different. And at this time, I'm going to present this resolution to the president of Georgia Farm Bureau, Gerald Long, and call him Gerald to make some comments. Some say this is Georgia Farm Bureau's most important event. That's because for the farmers and members who attend, it's the one time of year when they get to meet face to face with their elected officials and discuss the key issues affecting the ag industry. I mean, every, every year we're able to because the activism that we have at the county level, we're able to stop legislation. A lot of times we play more defense than offense. We're able to stop legislation. We're able to get legislation passed, all because of the grassroots level of our county, our county involvement. And that type of involvement even includes the future farmers of America. Judging by the number of corduroy jackets, a very good turnout for FFA this year. And for Locust Grove Chapter President Robert Prater, it was his first time visiting the state capitol. Intimidating, but enjoyable, according to Prater. Well, it was at first because I didn't know what to expect, and then after I got in there and realized how friendly and personable everybody was, I was more comfortable with being here. I was really impressed to see all of the um, other FFA members here and the schools around. That way everybody's learning about the agriculture and the awareness in the state and being able to meet all the legislators and the commissioners for agriculture. Well, believe it or not, we are now just a couple of months away from planting season for peanuts. While farmers need to be on the lookout for the usual pests and diseases, there's also a relatively new insect that is causing major damage in some fields around the state. With more on that, here's UGA peanut entomologist Mark Abney. It's a pest that's been in Georgia for many, many years. It's not an invasive species, uh, but it has not been a major problem until probably around 2010 when we started seeing some serious economic loss in peanuts because of feeding damage. A good way to think of it is a stink bug that lives in the ground. Most people know what a stink bug is and the burrow bug is very similar to that. It feeds in the same way. It's got a mouth that's like a hypodermic needle. It sticks its mouth parts into a peanut that's developing underground and sucks juice out of the seed which leaves a spot on the seed and makes it unsellable and unusable for either peanut butter or candy or snacks. Because the insect spends most of its time below ground and when it's not below ground it's usually nighttime, it's very difficult to monitor. It's hard for growers to know if they have a problem or not. And that's one of the issues, one of the research topics that we're working on here at the University of Georgia is trying to figure out how we can predict or monitor where the insect is in any given year. A grower plants his peanuts and he really doesn't know if burrow bug is going to be a problem or not. And it, it creates a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear because burrow bug damage is it's a really significant problem for growers who have it. I mean, it's, a, it's devastating in terms of econ economics. You go from a, a crop that could, right now, peanut contracts are $475 a ton. With burrow bug damage, that's $110 a ton. So the, the economic impact is absolutely devastating. There are only a few recommendations we have for growers who have burrow bug problems. One of those is deep tillage. Um, a lot of our peanut acreage is deep tilled every year, but a lot is not. We have a lot of growers who are using conservation tillage. They don't want to deep till, but that does help reduce burrow bug infestations. The other thing is an application of an insecticide called chlorpyrifos during the growing season. First of all, we, we got funding over the last couple of years from the National Peanut Board and the Georgia Peanut Commission to do some preliminary research. We took the findings of that work and put together a grant proposal that went to the USDA this past spring and we got funded to do a project and there's collaborators from USDA and Auburn University and here at the University of Georgia. And we've got a couple of main goals, but one of those is to try to figure out what it is, what are the risk factors that lead to burr bug infestations in a given field so that if a grower wants to plant peanuts 
in a field this year, what are the odds of that person having, or that field having burrow bug damage in, say, 2017? You know, we can find burrow bugs everywhere we look. We put light traps in 15 counties over the last two years, each of the last two years, and every light trap we catch burrow bugs, even in counties where they've never had economic loss because of the, the insects. So I think that none of our growers are completely free from risk. Uh, there have been some counties where we've had more problems than others. Counties that have historically higher levels of conservation tillage have tended to have ha more problems. Uh, but I think it's a problem when I talk to growers, if, if you have never had burrow bug issues on your farm, don't lose sleep at night worrying about burrow or bugs. But if you have had a problem, you know, those are the growers that we're, you need to think about maybe changing your tillage practices or using those, that granular insecticide. Well, just a reminder, if you missed any part of the story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel. That's the Georgia Farm Monitor. Once there, you can browse the archive of stories dating as far back as 2009. And of course, once you're done watching all those informative stories, just keep on clicking and like the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page we have set up for you. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, feel free to send us a message either on Facebook or at the address listed below. That is news at farm-monitor.com. When we come back, his friends call him Joe Dirt, and he's the man behind the dirtfarmers.com. See how this unique concept is providing a valuable service to area consumers. That is next when the Farm Monitor continues. Hey everybody, I'm Walter Reeves at Woodlands Garden in Decatur. There are few plants in the South that are more emblematic of the South than the Southern Magnolia. You recognize these glossy green leaves, gorgeous plant. You see them planted in front of churches, in front of houses. Many times you see them planted in places where they got way bigger than the person ever expected them to be because the Southern Magnolia is not a small plant. But did you know there are other kinds of magnolias in the South as well? In particular, there's one called the big leaf magnolia. And the big leaf magnolia is gigantic. The leaves on it are enormous. Sometimes the leaves are as long as two feet long. Look at this one right here that has been dried on the ground for a couple of months. You see that pine cone next to it? See how big it is? Two feet easily, and sometimes as much as 12 inches wide. So these deciduous magnolias lose their leaves in the wintertime as opposed to the evergreen southern magnolia. Although those of us who own a southern magnolia know that they're not all evergreen. They do lose their leaves sometimes, <laughs> and the leaves they lose have to be raked up and put back up underneath the southern magnolia because nothing will grow underneath there. It's too shady. The only memory I have of a southern magnolia from my childhood, and that's where all the bantam chickens lived. That's where all the panties went up into the southern magnolia and roosted at night to stay out of the way of the possums and the raccoons. So if you're looking for another native plant to put in your landscape, one that takes up not quite as much room as a southern magnolia, look for a deciduous magnolia. Big leaf magnolia or cucumber magnolia, both of them look great in the landscape. They have big white flowers just like southern magnolia does, and they're wonderful plants to have. One more thing, look at the flowers during the summertime when they come open. You'll never see a butterfly or a honeybee around that flower. Why? Because magnolias are so old that the only thing that pollinates them are beetles. Look for the beetles around a magnolia flower. It'll teach you a little bit more about the environment. More tips just like these coming up soon on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Finally today, from the dirt to your door. That's the motto of the dirtfarmers.com, a one-stop internet farmers market founded by Macon Zone Joe Zawacki, or as his friends call him, Joe Dirt. Today, the monitor profiles Joe and his unique concept, which he says is the result of growing up in small town western New York, known for its dairy farming and Amish country lifestyle. You know, growing up, there was a lot of uh, families coming together. Um, everyone had a spring garden, um, and if you didn't, you helped out. And everybody got together and did canning for the tough winter months. 
Um, we all had maple trees and everyone gathered the sap uh, together and we all made our own maple syrup. Uh, so that was my tr first true sense of, of community, of what friendship was, of what township is. Uh, everybody worked together, um, everybody cried together. So uh, my, my ag background um, would be from Belfast, New York. And it's crazy, I leave high school and said I'll never come back to this again. And you know, you go full circle and you come back to the things that made you happiest and that was my childhood in, in Belfast, New York. I was in commercial food service, so the, you know, the big conglomerates that deliver to the hotels, the restaurants, uh, the small mom and pops, the big chains. And uh, April 22nd, four years ago, um, I was sitting down with a group of friends. I had a beverage nap and I said, you know, how do I take my knowledge and experience in distribution and scale it down? and create a need. Um, I was already going to farmer's markets. I was going to like two or three throughout the month. I was shopping two or three different retailers to find my certified organic fruits, and my different grains, and it was really time consuming and, and, an, and an annoying process. So I had this idea of, you know, why can't I try to bring this down to a local level to bring all these people into one platform? And, you know, everyone wants convenience. Um, in middle Georgia, you, you see farmers markets getting slower and slower. Um, if it rains, they're not going out, but the farmers do. Um, so how do you create a sense of income for the farmer that's year round, whether it's rain or shine, and make it convenient for the consumer? As I built this business, I had a handful of farmers, no artisans. It wasn't a farmer's market concept. It was a traditional strict CSA. You could swap out one or two items. And I was getting feedback and, you know, nobody wants to eat turnips for nine weeks in a row, but they want to support the farmer. And then people were dropping out and I would be, hey, that's great. This isn't for everybody, but tell me why. So they wanted more variety and selection. So I started added, adding dairy farmers honey from the honey man, um, meat from the local meat guys, uh, and to now I, I basically took the retail concept because um, we've added certified organic fruit line and the local food aspect uh, to where it's a one-stop shop for you for your local needs. Um, there's over 100 to 150 different items on the online store any given week and it changes. Uh, all our artisans, we're not, this isn't a warehouse. We don't have things on a shelf waiting for you to buy like a, a local grocer. Um, things are prepared fresh, harvested fresh. Um, peanut butter is made fresh, you know, things like that. So you're gonna learn what we go through, uh, what your local agriculture goes through. We've developed um, and evolved into where the traditional CSA, it's a subscription, you're committing to us. You're committing to your local agriculture, to your local farmer, to your artisan. So that's an eight week subscription, but you can do it weekly or you can do it bi-weekly. We offer home deliveries, so we can deliver it to your house, you can pick up at our farm or different pickup locations. The, the farmers are, are my new family, they're my new norm, they're my new friends, and they've been essential to our growth and we've grown together we've learned a lot um, some of the farmers were able to leave their full-time jobs to be able to do this full-time some of the farmers still work a full-time job and do this because they're a smaller farmer um, but it, it's been a great marriage a, a great story um, for, for all of us involved and it's really helped stabilize what they want and um, meet a need that the community wanted and for more information on thedirtfarmers.com or how to become a member, just simply log on to the address you see there on the screen, thedirtfarmers.com. Click on How It Works tab, and you can also like them on Facebook. Very, very cool concept. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, folks, we are out of time. Just a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and Farm Monitor Show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.